Thanks for joining today. I know that euthanasia is not necessarily a topic that some people gravitate towards, but we know how important it is. We know what a big part of vet med uh, this procedure is and how important it is to get it right. So the title of our talk is Euthanasia Without Pain, which is so important. And yes, it can be done. And I'm guessing that um, there are some of you, and the reason why this title is just a little bit cheeky is because we always want euthanasia to be without pain, but I'm guessing that there are some of you that have had some painful euthanasia experiences, and whether or not that came from the technique itself when you were actually administering the euthanasia solution, or with maybe what's known as pre-euthanasia sedatives or anesthetics to induce that sleep. So no matter what, we know that our patients don't want to be painful, that our clients don't want their pets in pain, and that we don't want that to be a lingering effect. So hence, since, hence our time together today with euthanasia without pain. And a big thank you to Zometica and Assisi for bringing us in for this talk. And while I'm not going to be talking necessarily about Zometica products and Assisi products with regards to reducing pain during euthanasia, it's just the fact that they were wanting to bring in a talk like this just really goes to show how much a pain-free experience is front and center and, and top of mind for these groups. So thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting Kata in. Our agenda is going to be what pet owners consider painful and maybe how they would define a bad death or AKA of dysthanasia. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a recent survey that was written up in DVM 360 that talks about the top five things that pet owners want and find really important. Then we're gonna go into some protocols and tell you what's been working good for me over the years and what's been working good for some colleagues. And then we're gonna end with euthanasia techniques themselves, just in case you're wondering about you know, an intraorgan injection or intravenous, you know, what are those options? What can you be leveraging? Again, trying to reduce away pain at every turn with that euthanasia appointment. I also recognize that many of you are likely coming from different backgrounds to this talk. You know, we probably have DBMs and technicians, might even have practice managers with us. Those of you uh, veterinarians, you might be in industry, you might be in laboratory medicine, and certainly in private practice. So you, you have a wealth of experience in euthanasia behind you. So thanks for taking the time to see what tips and tricks and things we can bring forward to make it even better. So I am... I was listening to that bio and realizing that it's it's amazing how fast a uh, bio can start to get behind and a little out of date. I've actually got a few other things on my plate these days, in particular with being CEO of the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy and their director of education. I am also chief medical officer of Caring Pathways. Caring Pathways is a mobile hospice and veterinary service with three locations around the U.S. It's in Colorado, Virginia, and North Carolina, and expanding to other areas as well. So I help to write their euthanasia protocols and procedures, as well as their hospice protocols and policies, and making sure that when those doctors are delivering euthanasia, that yes, we are as pain-free as possible uh, through the entire appointment so that our client, our patients are not, you know, crying out, vocalizing, even moving in discomfort. We want to just remove that as much as we can. And with my work that I'm doing is working on being bored in the animal welfare through the American College of Animal Welfare. I do teach at Colorado State University, animal welfare, euthanasia, and hospice. And that's my alma mater. So I am coming to you from beautiful Loveland, Colorado today, about an hour north of Denver. So I'd like you to look at this picture and think about this, this scenario, right? It's very common for us to bring in the hospital setting, to bring our patients back to the treatment area and place a catheter. And while we don't know the full context of this picture, we would summarize or theorize that this animal is likely feeling some level of discomfort right? Whether or not it's just simply the restraint or listening to the sounds in the treatment area, or they might have pain already in their body that's being tweaked a little bit with this particular posture they're asked to be in or this position. And then of course, the pain that might come from the actual catheter placement. 
So the idea with a good death experience is to try to reduce pain and anxiety as much as possible. And that's going to be from beginning of the appointment all the way through to the end. So you, at your practice, at your facility, my guess is that you've got some standard operating procedures for euthanasia. And I'm hoping that we're going to give you some new ones, some new things to think about that you can bring back to your team and implement. And some of them are very easy and some of them take a little bit more work uh, to change the culture and the way that you practice. So with regards to ideal components and what we think that owners are looking for, and we know this actually, and I'll talk about it in a second, but the ideal components is that during euthanasia of the injection itself that our patient is sleeping. And when people are asked, you know, how do you describe your perfect just death of your pet? It's usually they wish that they would pass peacefully in the night so they don't even have to make a choice for euthanasia but in particular that they're sleeping, they're pain-free, they're comfortable. So the idea is to try to facilitate that through our, our procedure and the, and the method itself. No pain on injections, minimal restraint, safe environment leads to uh, where the animal is comfortable, again, decreased anxiety, but loved ones can be gathered around and it's just safe space, right? It's just safe space and usually very non-clinical. That's an important takeaway with that. Everyone is ready for euthanasia. That's always nice when we don't have questions about, is it the right time? Is today the day? But when we're actually moving forward with the procedure that everybody's on board. And then ideally, it's a quiet death with no vocalization or strong reactions to things that we're doing, which we don't like. And then quick death could actually have a question mark around it because a quick death doesn't necessarily equal a good death. A good death can take a little bit longer as long as the patient is comfortable and everyone who's there is watching is, is content with that. But typically a quicker death, one where the patient passes within uh, certainly a few minutes might be considered more ideal. So what are pet owners actually expecting when it comes to euthanasia? And what can we as veterinary professionals deliver to meet those expectations and to keep our patient comfortable? So we did a survey through CADA and asked pet owners how they define a good death. And the lovely thing about it is that we could come back around and then define a bad death or a dysthanasia. And we'll talk about how to handle that as we wrap up our time together. But the top five things, and you might even have them in your head of what you think that the pet owners would be wanting, but the top five things, number one is that the family and the pet can remain together through euthanasia the entire appointment, that they're never separated. So this means that we do everything in the comfort room or the exam room, in the home setting, it's, it might be in the living room or out in the backyard, whatever it is, that they're never separated. Number two is they want their pets sleeping. Okay, so they want that pre-euthanasia sedation and anesthesia. So then our job is to make sure that when we give those drugs that we're not creating more pain. Number three was they want no pain and no anxiety for their pet. They're really worried about it. And it behooves us to ask more questions so that we know what is going to trigger pain in the pet and, and where they maybe have had injections in the past that bothered them. We need, to, we need to ask those type of questions. The fourth thing they want is more help with pre-planning. So they want more information on the website about what does the euthanasia procedure look like? What are their choices, such as who can be there, when euthanasia can take place, where, and details like that. So pre-planning helps to reduce regret, which is always a good thing. And with pre-planning, we get a chance to ask more of the right questions that will hopefully reduce pain for our patient. And then number five, which we list as more of an honorable mention because it's not easy for every uh, hospital or service to provide, is home euthanasia. And so if you are in a region or you've got staffed appropriately to provide home euthanasia services, please know that owners are really, really loving that option. So those were the top five things that CADA found with our pet owner survey. And we published those results in, I believe it was August of 2022 in DVM 360's uh, magazine. 
And then we just right now are finishing up how veterinarians define a good death. And we're going to see how those two align and then create even stronger recommendations off of that. But you better believe it. Pet owners do not want their pets in pain. So CADA put together 14 essential components of companion animal euthanasia quite a few years ago. And you'll see that uh, it's an acronym, good euthanasia, and everything has something tied to it there. And in the word euthanasia, you'll see that the second A says avoid pain and anxiety. So the idea with this list is that after a euthanasia appointment, you get to say to yourself, did I do this? And did I do this? And did I attempt this? And so on. And if you did all of those things, then you can feel confident that you delivered a quality euthanasia appointment. And certainly avoiding pain and anxiety is way up there. We could do an entire talk just on what we refer to as euthanasia reimagined and all of these best practices tied to it. But today is about pain and anxiety. So reasons to provide you know, drugs, pre-euthanasia, sleep, uh, whether or not it comes from sedatives or anesthetics. Again, the reasons for is that most of our families want their pets sleeping in those final moments. So it's a lovely way to be able to provide that. Pain-free, of course, usually with these pre-drugs, we can have more closeness, especially for those animals that have been really tender in their body. They've been reluctant to be close and to snuggle, and now we've got them sleeping so we can provide that. And then often it allows for more of a one-person procedure. Uh, those of you who might be mobile out there, my guess is many of you are solo. You don't bring assistance with you or a technician. However, there are many that do. And then in the hospital setting, if you're short on staff, if you're able to get your patient sleeping, then euthanasia can be a one-person procedure, the actual technique itself. What's lovely as well is that our technique options increase. So we're going to talk today about intra-organ injections and the need for unconsciousness. But once our patients are unconscious, we can do uh, a delivery of euthanasia solution beyond just the vein. And then it's always wonderful to avoid aggression. So if we have a patient that we think is going to kind of reaching a tipping point of their tolerance of being handled and and being uh, close and, you know, kind of moved around the space, whatever that it is, that we can go ahead and get them sleeping so that from that point on, uh, it's a much more controlled environment. So there are probably some other reasons for that you might be thinking of, of why to use pre-euthanasia, sedation, or anesthesia. Those are just a few that I came up with. And if there's going to be reasons for, there's probably going to be reasons against. But we don't find that the against are strong enough or intense enough to not do it. So first one that is usually a biggest concern is enhancement of what we might refer to as a critical state. So that might be a patient that's already having a hard time breathing and now we put drugs on top of it, might make it harder for them to breathe. Certainly possible, but depending on our doses and what we're reaching for, sometimes we make it better. We make it easier for them to breathe so that those final moments are more comfortable. Seizures, we sometimes worry about uh, vomiting, drop in blood pressures and that cardiac output. But again, it's usually not significant enough for us to say it's not worth it. It's just more important for us to finesse those drugs and get just that right cocktail. Yes, a little greater expense. Yes, it's another injection, but it's the only injection that the patient will know because from there, they're going to relax into a very deep sleep. So everything I'm going to go over with these drugs is not going to be a light state of sleep, which you are welcome to do unless you're going to do an intra-organ injection where they have to be, again, completely unconscious. But for the most part, we want them out and snoring in their final moments. And then yes, a little bit of longer appointment time, because depending on what you're reaching for, it may take another five, 10 minutes, just depending, but that can be very positive time. And then every once in a while, there is a, maybe a religious or spiritual conflict where a pet owner does not want their animal to be asleep during their passing. I put it in there simply because you may have experienced this yourself, but it is not very common in my world. And I have certainly euthanized a lot of sweeties, well over 10,000. And I can only think of a few times where a family said, I want our, you know, our pet to be wide awake for their passing. And when that does happen, there is an increased risk of pain on that injection. 
The drugs that we're reaching for are listed here, and some of them are sedatives and some of them are anesthetics. And we're going to go ahead and look at those a little bit closer. And just to be, you know, even more clear that there is a difference between a sedative drug and an anesthetic, especially if we're using anesthetics at anesthesia inducing doses. Because like, for example, you can use ketamine for pain management as we often do with hospice cases, but when you're giving it anesthetic doses, it's a totally different drug. So the important thing to remember here is that when you're mixing drugs into a sedation or anesthesia cocktail, is that as soon as you put an anesthetic in it, it becomes an anesthesia protocol. Otherwise, it's just going to remain a sedative protocol. And sedatives, on average, induce a lighter plane of sleep than true anesthetics, meaning that with enough stimulation, that patient or that pet can regain some awareness. So the last thing we want is to be combining, for example, a phenothiazine like acepromazine with an opioid like butorphanol and maybe some xylazine, okay, something like that, and expecting that to be enough of a drug cocktail for an intracardiac injection. It may not be, especially if we're not going to deep enough doses that it might almost be like an overdose themselves. So if you're going to go with an intraorgan injection, we need to get an anesthetic in there, typically the dissociatives. All right, routes of administration. You're likely very familiar with this already, but know that we can give these pre-euthanasia drugs sub subcutaneous, intramuscular. If you've already got a catheter place, you can give them intravenously. Uh, they can be via inhalation of anesthetic drugs like isoflurane. And then one of my favorites is to actually reach and leverage more of the oral pre-euthanasia sedatives, things like gabapentin, detomidine gel, and trazodone and more where we can get them sleeping before we do anything at all. What a lovely way to reduce pain during the actual euthanasia appointment. Here are some examples of common combinations that you will see for pre-euthanasia um, drug protocols, such as the first one being sedation. You'll see there that there's no anesthetic in there. It's just sedative drugs. Dexmedetomidine, one of my absolute favorites, butorphanol and ACE. So that would be all combined into one syringe given to the patient, either sub Q or IM, wait till they relax into deep sleep, and then we administer the euthanasia solution. The example two, there's an anesthetic, and it's an anesthetic protocol because it's got a dissociative drug, that teletamine in there, and then some supportive drugs to help reduce any kind of some of those negatives sometimes that we see with our drugs like dissociatives with a little bit of euphoria or dysphoria, some hallucinations and things like that. Here are a couple more examples. These are both anesthesia. I love alfaxalone, so I'm, I'd be curious if some of you are using it out there for, for euthanasia purposes. We know it's a good drug for inducing anesthesia for surgery, but it's really nice for cats, and it doesn't have the heat to it that we know our dissociative drugs do. And then the last one, example four, might be for those of you, if you don't have teletamine in your neck of the woods, you might be reaching for ketamine and adding in some midazolam. All right, so also just a reminder that a lovely way to reduce pain, if we're worried about heat from our, our cocktail of drugs, like if it's got a dissociative in there or a midazolam or just a low pH in general, that we can do what's called a two-step protocol, where maybe for a little sweetie like this, we go ahead and give a sub-Q injection of butorphanol and acepromazine in the same syringe give that to her, allow her to relax for a few minutes. Maybe she takes a deep sigh and kind of lays her head down and gets more comfortable. And then we can go ahead and either place an IV catheter if we want and administer propofol to help her go even deeper in her sleep. Or maybe at that point, we give her an IM injection of ketamine to help her go even deeper. And then we can choose what euthanasia technique we want. This is a good time to take a picture, if you like, or a screenshot, where these are my protocols that I typically use for dogs. And I have two different protocols for dogs. I have a sedation protocol and an anesthesia. So this afternoon, I've got an old pity that's coming in for euthanasia. He's about 60 pounds. And because of his size and the fact that more than likely he's going to have some decent veins for me to work with, I'm going to go ahead and just give him a really heavy sedation protocol, relax 
relax them into deep sleep and then probably place an IV catheter for euthanasia. If I were concerned about placing a catheter on him, I might reach for an anesthesia protocol so that I've already got him fully anesthetized. So I could do an intrahepatic injection or an intracardiac injection. It just gives me more options. So these are my protocols for dogs. And then these are my protocols for cats. These are both anesthesia protocols. So the teletamine, the acepromazine, and that now bufine or butorphanol, that would be in one syringe. Or I might reach for my alfaxalone protocol, and that would be something different. So I carry both teletamine and alfaxalone, okay? Now, I only do, or at least prefer to only do intrarenal injections in cats. So I need them anesthetized. And so these are my protocols. And by the way, those of you who might not be familiar with nalbufine, nalbufine is like a non-controlled version of butorphanol. And I loved it. I used it for years and years and years. And then the manufacturer started to sell it by the case. And I, it would take me a long time to go through a case of nalbufine as at the moment I practice solo by myself, independent from CADA, independent from Caring Pathways. I've got my little comfort center here in Colorado where families come to me for euthanasia. And so it doesn't behoove me to buy an entire case of nalbufine. But if you like that idea and you want to look into what that drug is, it's like a non-controlled version of TOR. But these days I'm using Btorphanol. So hope I'm clear on this so far that we are seeking to provide a sub-Q or IM injection to our patients to allow them to work into very deep sleep before we move forward with the actual euthanasia procedure. And that is going to be administration, most likely of pentobarbital or a pentobarbital combination product that would be through the vein or into an organ. And we'll talk about those coming up. All right, so the big question is, what do we do if we're worried about some sting on injection? And after all the years that I've been teaching euthanasia, this still is one of the number one questions that comes up. I just hate when they react. Absolutely, we all do. So I have just reached out to a uh, pain practitioner to say, you know what, we really need to get rid of these the sting once and for all. And so we're coming up with some good ideas and we're going to roll through some of them right now, but we don't necessarily have a whole lot of data on it yet. It's a, it's a lot of uh, experiential and anecdotal. So we're hoping that we'll get finally to a, yes, this is your end all be all, never going to have sting again answer. So factors that may worsen uh, an, a patient to react to an injection with a dissociative like ketamine or teletamine, it might, first of all, just be their patient temperament. They might be most likely to react to anything. So it's kind of good to know that ahead of time if possible. Their acceptance of handling in general, and perhaps their experience already with injections, right? Maybe we've got a cat, for example, that's had tons of insulin injections for diabetes, and they're just over it right? They just don't want it anymore. And, and, or they were never being handled well by their owners in the first place. And so they're really reluctant to that restraint. Injecting a sore area, we might have allodynia or hyperesthesia where just any little thing is going to set them off. And then of course, if we're rubbing an area that's already painful, especially right after we give a dissociative, that can create some more heat. I don't know how many of you know who Bill the Cat is, but that's an ancient reference to an old cartoon called Bloom County, I believe. And I just thought that that uh, picture was kind of cute for this whole dissociative issue. So if you think that there will be a reaction, whether or not it's dissociative based or anything else, is to open up some dialogue with the owner. How has he been with injections in the past, right? And more importantly, is, is he sensitive anywhere that I should know about so you can avoid that? And when describing the injection itself, I usually refer to it as not like this has been known to burn, this has been known to sting. I usually soften that language up a little bit with this medicine has a little heat to it. And if they react and they talk to me, I understand. Uh, hopefully they're gonna forget about it very quickly and just welcome that sleep. Okay, now something that's not in the slides, but I've been talking more and more about lately is it's okay to ask the owner 
and kind of get their opinion about whether an injection is even the right way to go, or do we want to switch and give something oral to begin with? Now, dogs, that's relatively easy because we have detomidine gel, also known as dermosidan by Zoetis. So we have that at the ready for us um, to give and relax our patients. That's really, really uh, well tolerated. But uh, for cats, that's not quite so easy for really quick relaxation. We can squirt teletamine in the mouth and acepromazine. We can even give a little bit of dexmedetomidine orally, uh, but sometimes we get a fair amount of drooling with these drugs and they don't necessarily taste the most pleasant. So yes, we can mix these in with, with food and with things like uh, cream, uh, honey I've heard, even though cats, for example, don't have sweet receptors in their mouth. So the honey might not be necessarily a big benefit to them, but it's at least a vehicle to help get the, the meds in. But yes, we can give some things orally to relax them. And where I'm going with all of this is that if you would prefer to give drugs oral, just to talk to the owner and say, I can give an injection, but if we're worried they're going to notice it, maybe we give it into the mouth. How do they feel about their mouth being handled? And if they say, oh, that's going to be worse than even the injection, then collectively now we're all making the choice to give the injection. And therefore, if there is a little bit of a reaction, then we're at least prepared for it, right? And it was the lesser of the two evils. So there's been a lot of discussion out there, and rightfully so, about what can we mix in with these cocktails to reduce that, that heat away. So whether or not we can work with additives into, you know, like reconstituting teletamine, for example, with an additive or within the syringe itself, putting in another diluent or, or just something to dilute it. In fact, I love the saying, dilution is the solution to pollution, pollution being the dissociative sting that's possible and, and trying to neutralize that a bit. So conversations out there, I've heard about buffered lidocaine or mepivacaine. Lidocaine actually has a low pH with a sting to it. And so that can be buffered up to a neutral pH of seven, although that's a bit more complicated. But mepivacaine actually has been known not to have um, immediate sting associated with it. So I think mepivacaine's got some interesting potential. We can mix in bicarb. You can just delete out or dilute out with more plasmalite or saline. There's been some talk out there about B12. Um, I'll show you here in a moment a pH chart that I can't quite explain why B12 would work, but a lot of people swear by it. There's been talk about just the dilution with adding an acepromazine makes a difference, but not enough necessarily to take away all of that sting. So it's it does some good, but not necessarily all of it. And then certainly other drugs that we're mixing in in combination that we might see a bit more of neutralization. So feel free in the, in the Q&A if you wanted to pop in some other thoughts there, I'm all for it. And then when in doubt, of course, or no matter what, it's got to be treats, treats, and more treats to distract as much as possible. So there might be a patient that, yeah, they might react to that injection if there is no distraction, but as soon as we get the that churro out and, and pill pockets is what I've used for years and uh, bowls of bacon grease, which is one of my favorite things that an owner brought in, um, I think that that uh, makes a big difference or we know that it makes a big difference. So please consider that distraction. Here's that little chart that I mentioned that I went ahead and assessed with a pH reader on what was actually going on in telazole when we reconstituted with some of these uh, additives. And you'll see that B12 right there in the middle, that pH was still pretty darn low. So by itself, it's 3.9. And then when you mix it with telazole, it was still less than three. That's very acidic. So if B12 works, it might be that it's neutralizing an alcohol or something, but it's it's not the pH. And you can see that with plasmalite, it uh, by itself, it's a nice neutral pH. When you put it in with telazole, it's maybe a little bit higher than it would be with just saline or, or by itself, um, but not very dramatic. The biggest difference was with adding in actual bicarb. Okay. Actual bicarb made a big difference. So with that, I'd like to share a protocol of Dr. Beth Marchitelli out of North Carolina. She and I did a talk a couple of years ago for the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care, where the talk was taking the sting out of teletamine and dissociatives. And her protocol is a combination of telazole, acepromazine, and butorphanol in one syringe, 
And then she mixes in another syringe that's got plasmolite and bicarb in it. So take a screenshot of this if you're interested in trying it. It's a little bit complicated in the fact that ultimately the goal is to make sure that before the injection is given, that it's as neutral pH as possible. So she's got her drug protocol in one syringe, she's got plasmolite with bicarb in the other, and then right before the injection to the patient, she combines them into one syringe and then does a pH testing strip to see if it's neutral. And if it's not, she'll add in another drop of bicarb, okay? But she's actually doing pH testing strips right before injection, which is... Uh, brilliant if you can work that out in a very delicate way during the appointment just to make sure that there's uh, reduced pain. I think it's great. So just some takeaways on giving sub-Q or IM injections is to move slow, be calm with your patient, distract as much as you can. You desensitize the area by rubbing, by tenting a little bit and rubbing, and then inject very slowly Use a small needle if possible, and we'll mention that again here in a moment, uh, but only go fast if you need to. So if we have a really active wiggly body, but they're more likely to notice it and react with it. So this might be a good opportunity for a two-step protocol with something more benign first, like just Torb and ACE, maybe a little dexmedetomidine mixed in, and then give something with a little more heat if needed. Common injection sites, um, pretty common ones right there. It will say that there is research that shows that the apaxial muscles are actually a really good spot to give, or just that apaxial region in general. They tend to be less sensitive there uh, for most of the patients that my audience here today is likely, is likely working with, so for dogs and for cats. Again, inject slowly, go small needle. And then I'm gonna show you a video here in a moment of a cat relaxing with, in fact, I'll just move to it and then describe it as we watch. But this little girl, I'm going to give a teletamine combination to just kind of in her thigh area because there really wasn't much to inject and work with along her spine. She looks like she has some decent kind of muscle mass to her here, but most of what you see are mats and fecal mats. She's very, very thin. So she did not notice that um, combination drug that I just, or the combination protocol that I just gave in her thigh. And what I'd like to do immediately is to rub for my sedative protocol, but I can't do that with dissociatives like ketamine and teletamine. You gotta give just a moment for that drug to sit in the space. And then you see, I bring my hand down and then I start to massage a little bit. Okay, she's like, oh, there's something out the window right there. But then I just start to massage a little bit and then help to work that in. And I do a lot of massage in my euthanasia work. It just speeds that absorption and makes everything much smoother. So this is, you guys all know how to give a sub-Q injection, but I'll go ahead and give my, I've got to give my um, slide presentation here just a second, it was spinning. I'll go ahead and just play this. I'll show you how I give a sub-Q uh, shot to my own dog. I just tent a lot. You can again do this in the apaxial region. But once I've actually got the injection in, then what I've also been known to do is once I'm injecting, I go ahead and just kind of move my hand around and tickle a little bit as further distraction, which seems to be well received by my patients. All right. So just switching gears a little bit before we move on and talk about some oral sedatives and then into techniques. When you give these medicines, it is safest to stay in the room. So rather than stepping out and doing other things um, and waiting for your patient to relax and then kind of check back in to see how they're doing, it's safest to stay in the room in case you need to support any of their physical needs. Help to create that calm setting. And then when ready, when your patient is actually laying down and welcoming that sleep, then you can begin your preparations for euthanasia. Oral sedatives, uh, the Fear Free program is huge with this. So if you are Fear Free certified or thinking about it, uh, there's lots of good information that they share. But I also wanna let you know that CADA has a blog on this where we go into more detail. And those of you who take the CADA master program, the certificate program, we teach a lot about oral pre-visit uh, pharmaceuticals. 
I hope someday that there is a change in the laws, in the rules and regs, uh, statewide and federal wide, federal wide for veterinarians, that with euthanasia as the end point, that we can establish more electronic VCPRs so that for uh, patients that really would benefit from oral pre-visit pharmaceuticals, that we can do uh, virtual VCPRs and be able to script those out. Right now, that's, you know, state by state might allow it, but it's not very common yet. But I think it's a direction that we as a profession might want to consider going. So key takeaway points on that sedation and anesthesia, we're just looking for pain-free. So take your time, slow down, ask questions, determine what's going to be best for this patient. And remember that anesthesia is different than sedation, and it's going to be required for intra-organ injections. And it is now gold standard, by the way, to provide pre-euthanasia sedation and anesthesia. And for most of the groups like ABMA, AHA, CADA, and Fear Free, this goes beyond the propofol, right? So if we're really talking about pain-free we and reducing restraint, we are doing the, we're administering these drugs before we're doing anything technical for euthanasia. If you still want to give propofol before your pentobarbital, go for it. But we are encouraging you to do more before those catheters are placed and before propofol might be administered. So with that, thinking about choosing the right technique then for euthanasia itself and making sure that we're reducing down pain, you are going to have a lot of choices out there. We've already mentioned kind of five of them. And it's going to be dependent on which one you like with your comfort and your skill, what supplies you've got, whether or not, again, they do have pre-euthanasia drugs on board, what the owners are comfortable watching and, and observing. The type of euthanasia solution is, it's a mild or a minor um, kind of factor here, but it does make a difference. So Kata happens to be a big fan of Fatal Plus, the pure pentobarbital, because we can give it in more ways, including oral and interperitoneal on awake animals, which is why they use it so commonly in shelters. In fact, it's the only drug to my knowledge in the United States that's used in shelters is the blue Fatal Plus pure pentobarbital. The pink is actually not supposed to be given oral and it's not supposed to be given uh, interperitoneally in awake animals. So just because it's got that additive in it. And then the signal met and physical condition of your pet or your patient is going to dictate which one you reach for. And then of course, we don't necessarily wanna be loading up the kidney, for example, with pentobarbital if we have to send that body in for a necropsy. All right, so just an example of some setups. We are a big fan of placing indwelling IV catheters. To us, it reduces risk. And usually by reducing risk, we are reducing risk of pain. So just an example of some extension sets. And just a reminder that when it comes to euthanasia, if our patient is sound asleep, we don't have to tape in these catheters with just all kinds of, of prep. You know, it's not like they're going in for surgery. If they're asleep and not going to be moving much, just a simple strip of one inch white tape is all that it takes to anchor in your setup. Those of you who like butterflies, perfectly fine as long as they're, uh, you know, heavily sedated or anesthetized first. And same goes with direct venipuncture. There's just risk of pain if these things slip outside of the vein. So we're a big fan of reducing that risk with indwelling IV catheters. If you are going to move forward with intracardiac injections, you want to do assess for deep pain. So really do a good toe pinch in between those, in between the toes and that webbing, making sure that they're not pulling back. You can do a palpebral kind of reflex check. Um, if you're going to be giving something into the abdomen, making sure that there's no abdominal muscle tensing, they just need to be deep as if you were going to do surgery. And you can get them deep enough with those with those IM injections or sub-Q injections. And by the way, we are working on right now, uh, just building out a research study that looks at the pain trace device from BioTraceIt, the pain trace device to see whether or not our animals, our patients that appear to be unconscious, and then we're doing an intraorgan injection of whether or not there is any indication that our patient is still uh, experiencing pain. So if you're not familiar with pain trace yet, I encourage you to check it out. It's a pretty cool device. Um, I'm interested in where it goes from here and what we learn about its applicability in, in different settings, but we're hoping to use it to study to see whether or not our patients are truly deep enough for these injections.
So you've got intracardiac, you've got intrahepatic, and this center illustration is just to show how much room you've got to work with there in the liver. And the idea with these locations is to give the euthanasia solution in an area of high perfusion to get that pentobarbital up to the brain to do its work. That's how it elicits uh, overdose and death. And then intrarenal is a fabulous technique, very, very elegant and simple, and it's very, very fast. So you just need to inject that liver tissue, I'm sorry, that kidney tissue, and your patient will pass within usually a minute's time. Now with your approval, everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and show an actual euthanasia video. So if you do not wish to see this, please just go ahead and divert your gaze. But this is the little sweetie that I anesthetized previously. And she's sound asleep now. She's sound asleep and you see me go ahead and isolate her left kidney with my left hand. My right hand is actually kind of pushing that kidney up a little bit. And then I find my syringe and insert in. And again, she is completely pain-free right now because she's in deep, deep sleep. And you're gonna see her and part of my injection here, she's gonna take a deep breath right there. And she's already welcoming, welcoming that medicine up to her brain. And she is completely passed before I'm even done with my injection. And me moving my hand is just to show how you can shield that a little bit from the owners if you wish. So very pain-free, comfortable passing for her, which is always our goal. Intraperitoneal, real quick, just to let you know, you're probably not doing a lot of these unless you're in the shelter setting, but um, I personally don't do these unless my patient is already sound asleep. They don't have to be anesthetized for this, just even good heavy sedation is fine, but there's still risk of pain with it. So um, more than likely, if you are going to be going somewhere besides the vein, you might as well just anesthetize and then you can go into an organ that has higher perfusion. So if you do have pain, what do you do? If it's really obvious, if it's, if it's clear that we have upset our family, let them know that you're gonna be calling the next day. Just say, you know, this did not go as expected. No, no, none of us wanted that for her, for her to be painful. We, we do our best to keep it very smooth and pain-free, but if it's all right, we'd like to call tomorrow and just to check in, see how you're doing and, and answer any questions that you have. And then the person who's going to be calling should know what happened and, and know why that pain occurred. Try to call within 24 hours, not too soon in case they're angry, but uh, within 24 hours before things kind of get out of control. And also keep in mind that what you perceived as painful for your patient, your family might not have perceived that. So read the room and, uh, you know, they might be perfectly fine with it. It might be you know, such a thing that their their pet was always painful and was really difficult to work with and all that. So while we didn't want that pain reaction, they might not necessarily have an issue with it. And it was just par for the course, but again, not ideal. Create a positive from it is a legacy, right? To say what happened, how can we make it better next time? And you might even be wanting to change your protocols because of it. And therefore you debrief with the team and you say, hey, is anybody else experiencing this? And, and what can we do to collectively and, and change those policies and those protocols and so that it never happens again? There's always a way to create a positive from it. The Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy has just launched, and I mean just launched about three days ago in the beginning of November, uh, end of October, 2022, our Euthanasia Case Review Department. So if you have pet owners that just need to talk about what happened, they're not listening to you, they're not hearing you to say that this was actually very normal and she had a peaceful passing, you can send them our way and we will actually do a case review, which is complimentary to the pet owners. And then if you yourself just want to talk about it or say, you know, we just need some help at our hospital, we're just not getting the results that we want and you're eager to change those protocols, you can reach out and we do one-on-one -on -one consulting as well. So you can just check, check the box online that says I'm a veterinary professional and we'd be honored to help. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna offer a, a, a tip here on what we refer to as you harmony, and that's protecting the team and making sure that you are approaching euthanasia as simply and as smoothly and with as much meaningful, uh, you know, kind of action behind it as you can. There's a concept called self-regulation. So that is getting your body in a nice relaxed state before you go into euthanasia. Therefore, if things start to get challenging, you can calm your body even more and that's gonna cut down on primary or secondary traumatic stress, which is a building block towards compassion fatigue. So we have to be very calm when we go into these appointments. 
be mindful about what you're walking into. And again, ask the right questions about what's going to be potentially painful for your patient. What have they gone through before that we want to avoid this time, right? If need be, if you're performing a lot of euthanasia and it's starting to wear you down or you see that with your staff, first of all, talk about making the protocols better, but we might wanna just talk to management about figuring out ways to limit appointment volume for those who can't handle quite so much. Management should be doing regular check-ins with staff about euthanasia. And then of course, increase education, 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 which I know that Zomedica University would be happy to help with as well as CADA too. We have over almost 40 hours worth of euthanasia related content now. And when in doubt, right, if we're really worried about causing our patient pain and we've got enough time to prepare for it, and if you think somebody else could potentially do a better job, reach out there. There's, there's likely to be euthanasia experts in your community now. We've got more end-of-life specialty services in 2022 than we've ever had before. So they might be mobile. They might be at a specialty hospital where they've taken you know, advanced euthanasia education where we can hand that family off and that patient off to somebody who we know is going to be potentially even more delicate and gentle um, than what we're able to do for whatever reason. So there's lots of, lots of experts out there now. So I'd like to, you to think to yourself in the span of this really fast hour before we get to our Q and A is today I learned this. And hopefully you've been writing down some notes or you've just got it in the mind and you should write it down now is today I learned this and this is what I wanna bring to my team to start to make those changes. And that's how it all happens, right? Little sparks in a, in a webinar like this to say, hmm, I can do that, or I'd like to learn more about it and bring it to your team and make those adjustments. Because we know that quality euthanasia is absolutely outstanding medicine. Our clients expect it. They expect the best of the best, especially as those human animal bonds grow and develop. And our, our pets are revered more and more like family members. The way that we used to do euthanasia, even, ah, even 10 years ago, isn't as acceptable as what we know modern best practices are today, and we should be leveraging those. Keeping the pet and the family together at all times, using those pre-euthanasia sedatives or anesthetics before we do anything technical, reaching for those drugs that aren't going to cause that burn and that sting, using more pre-visit pre pharmaceuticals like those oral drugs. All of that is now really modern best practice. It's good for animal welfare and certainly keeps vet med as a respected industry. If you want to keep the conversation going and haven't been uh, invited yet into this group, this is your formal invitation. This is open to all veterinary professionals, whether or not it's CSRs to practice managers to techs and DVMs. We have shelter personnel that are participate in this group as well. And we talk about anything you'd like with euthanasia.